1940, 3,000 RAF pilots fought in the Battle of Britain, many with just a few hours' experience flying a Spitfire or Hurricane. In this series, four young pilots are competing for the chance to be trained as a Battle of Britain pilot. After a week flying on Tiger Moths, only two now survive. They will now battle for the ultimate prize, nine hours at the controls of a real World War II Spitfire. For the first part of their challenge, our four pilots spent last week at Headcorn Airfield in Kent, testing their flying skills on a 1930s Tiger Moth, exactly the aircraft many of the Battle of Britain veterans used for their basic training before the war. The two pilots who came through were RAF trainee John Sweet and private pilot David Mallon. They're now at Duxford, one of the key airfields used in the Battle of Britain and now home to Carolyn Grace's unique aircraft, a 1944 Mark IX Spitfire that saw action on D-Day and was converted after the war into a two-seat trainer. Last week, she gave them both a taste of what it is to fly a Spitfire. This week, they will be trying to prove to her that it should be them going forward to the same nine-hour operational training course that many of their 1940s counterparts received prior to the Battle of Britain. The shadow of the conquering German armies covered Western Europe. The self-styled master race was riding high. Back in May 1940, British pilots were about to find themselves on the front line. Hitler's armies had swept across the continent. Britain's turn was next. 3,000 fighter pilots were all that stood in the way. Their job would be to stop the Luftwaffe in its tracks. The next four months would make heroes out of the RAF, a process that the succeeding decades have done nothing to diminish. I was a schoolboy a few months before, and now I was in the thick of it. I'd never seen anything like it before, and I couldn't believe my luck, really. It was pretty hazardous game, and um, a bit exciting, I must confess. They were blue-eyed boys. <laughs> the brill cream boys, as they called us. <laughs> When the battle finally started in July 1940, these Brill Cream boys had much to learn. In this programme, we'll look at the first month of the battle and the ferocious baptism of fire suffered by the young pilots, as they discovered if they had what it took to survive, never mind shoot planes down. Last week, Dave and John had the chance to familiarise themselves with the controls of a World War II fighter. Now they need to fly it for themselves. Their first priority is to learn how to fly straight and level, then how to climb and dive, and finally, how to fly the Spitfire in steep turns. Only then will they be ready to move on to more complicated manoeuvres. Again, you need to be at one with the aeroplane. It's absolutely imperative that you are that, because if you are going into battle, you don't want to have to be thinking about how to fly the aeroplane, so that when you go into the aerobatic side and the formation side, flying the aeroplane is not a problem. Germany overran France in short order, bringing her to her knees in barely six weeks. The invasion of Britain seemed inevitable, but even the triumphant Germans knew they would have to tame the RAF before even thinking about crossing the Channel. On the 30th of June 1940, Goering issued the order, smash the RAF. The Battle of Britain was about to begin. Pre-war RAF pilots had had months flying their Hurricanes and Spitfires, notching up hundreds of hours in training. But there were far too few of them, so new pilots were given crash courses, joining their squadrons often with less than 10 hours at the controls of a fighter. The same amount of training that our two pilots are competing for. They were all, without exception, very, very young. 
Okay, you have control. I have control. Within ten months of leaving school, raising my hat to the headmaster, within ten months I was in the Spitfire Squadron. Imagine passing your driving test, being allowed to drive for a few days and then enter for a Grand Prix race against the best drivers in the world on a racing circuit. And by the way, if you lose, you'll probably be crippled or dead. So you better learn fast. That's about the size of the challenge that these kids, and they were kids, we're talking about 18, 19, 20 year olds, faced in the summer of 1940. With the training, it's learning to fly the aircraft. I imagine most of the actual skills in, in the fighting is learned once you got sent to a squadron and speaking to the experienced pilots there, you would, you would learn tricks. I'm back down to 2400 because I got plus four. Okay. Slightly cooled down. I'm going to put the main tank off now. Leave out the way. 1500 feet. Seems First look out and the gear is definitely up. The attacks began in early July 1940. First came nuisance raids designed to probe British defences, while the main German attacks were directed at channel shipping. The plan was to destroy valuable convoys and to draw the RAF up into the air where the Luftwaffe was convinced they would make easy prey for their Messerschmitts. The first major clashes occurred on the 10th of July battle had been joined. From the beginning, it was clear that the RAF was different from the other armed services. Fighter pilots knew they were an elite and reveled in it. But it was an elite built on ability, not just social background. Fighter Command drew its pilots from a wide variety of men. The image of the fighter pilot on the British side is of a rather languid public schoolboy and uh, doesn't care about discipline very much and doesn't take his job terribly seriously, but um, manages to shoot down hordes of German aircraft because of his innate superiority in breeding. But fighter command, in fact, was much more diverse than that. About one-third were sons of tradesmen, of butchers, of farmers from Manchester and Liverpool, as well as from rural Gloucestershire and Sussex. And so the class barriers, which were endemic in British society at the time, actually began to break down rather faster in the RAF under the pressures of combat than they did in civilian society as a whole. But what was more important than the variety in their backgrounds was the strength of their common purpose. We tend to forget how young they were, often their 18, 19, early 20s. So they're driven, they're energetic, they're enthusiastic. They seem to have some incredible morale and fighting spirit which drives them on at a time when there's desperate need, you know, when we're threatened with invasion, when the major cities are being bombed, when it doesn't look as if Britain will necessarily survive as an independent nation. Discovering one evening when I went to see my wife that she'd been sitting at her dressing table putting on her lipstick with the window wide open and some clumsy chap had dropped a bomb not far away and a piece of 